Yeah, okay. Hello. Everything up and running? Yeah, all I have to do now is select good. So Hagen, I thought you were traveling today. No, I was traveling. Uh, I was traveling last week. I'm oh. gonna be away from Marius' talk. That's the problem. Oh right. Okay, I got that confused. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm gonna so be Marius in the forest. In two weeks. Who do we have in two weeks? Marius Clor. Yes. Oh, wow. so we have two magnetic resonance talks uh, in, in a, a row. row. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great technique. You can't have enough of it, right? <laughs> That's true. It's true. All right. Okay, so I guess we can wait a few more minutes before we start and we'll get more people in. Yeah, for sure. So Agen, what are you playing right now? Uh, right now I'm not, I'm, I'm watching a webinar, but you see? No, I mean, in principle. It looks like Chopin. You're practicing with. It looks like Chopin in the back. Uh, Nocturne. Actually, I still didn't listen to the, to the Schubert recordings that you sent me. I, I still have to actually. Okay. You should at some point. Yeah, he's, he's quite impressive, this guy. Well, actually, uh, Dima depresses me um, uh, every week. He says, sort of sends me some updates from time to time, um, always upon my request. So, so how far he got in, in training. And I think he's currently playing some weird cello sonata uh, by Shostakovich, uh, which is a crazily difficult piece, and he, he does it very well. Actually, maybe we should have a concert by him at some point. But who is doing the cello part? A friend of him, actually, a student. They they have a very good uh, music school in Austin. Yeah, I know. He told he told us okay. about that. Yeah, pretty cool. I mean, he's a serious musician. He's a really serious uh, musician. Absolutely. Yeah. Hello, Peter. Hello, hello. Hello, Peter. Hello, good hello. To see you. Yeah. It's good to see Mei Hong. How's uh, Bin doing? Oh, Bin is doing great. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. I see lots of papers coming from them, really important papers, That's really right. great. Papers. That's right, yeah. But I didn't know whether, you know, his family and all that, but uh, that's good to hear. Yeah, he's thriving. Yeah. And do you ever see John Deutsch? Oh, very rarely. Uh, oh, okay. I, I don't, yeah, I don't know much. I never well, really- you see him, say hello from me. Okay. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, he was uh, present at um, John Waugh's uh, memorial, uh, but you know, the, I, I, I don't think he teaches anymore, right? You know, no, so, no, he's, you know, he's got to be 82 or something like yeah, that. Let's say yeah. 39, he's born. In 39, yeah. so yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's no chance to interact. I guess, you know, I, I see people in seminars and faculty meetings and, you know. Uh, right, people, right, 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 right. Well, I normally see him once or twice a year at the Philosophical Society, but he, but we haven't had any meetings in person yeah. for two yeah. years now. Yeah. I mean, or a year and a half or. Yeah. Three or four, three or four meetings have been. Well, yeah, I'm sure he's much more famous in uh, non-scientific uh, circles. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he had this story with the bag that he left in his car, or something like that. Like that was. The story. Oh, I, I, uh -oh. I'm not sure about that. I think that's a confused story, but I also, I, I do remember something. But I don't think it was that that big deal. I think it's more he made enemies. I mean, I can tell you from Bob Silby. He told Bob Silby, who was probably not supposed to tell me, but basically, John made enemies at the CIA, as he would do anywhere, just as I would do anywhere, because we try to do a good <laughs> job. 
And the problem is when you make enemies at the CIA, that's much more serious than, you know, enemies in the protein folding world, you know? <laughs> yeah, I guess. <laughs> right. But uh, I guess it was his choice to be involved in uh, that kind oh, of- Well, he, he, I would say, in fact, that was more his dream. He, uh, even when he was a graduate student, he was working for the government. I see. Oh, really? He worked he consistently through his whole career. I would say the science thing was a hobby. <laughs> it was wow. a complete hobby for him. He really, you know, that was his, 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 his world there, really. He's a good, he's a good, he's a very good amateur scientist, but, you know, but <laughs> he taught me a lot, but. <laughs> Actually, there's something we're doing right now that uses some of the stuff that he had been, um, you know, developing, which he developed with one of my students who postdoc with him, that's going to be very exciting, but it's, uh, we're, yeah, we're in the middle of writing that. Equation, tell right? I, I remember yeah. seeing it in the library when I was a graduate student. It was called it's, the master equation. Oh, well, you know, the master equation is a bit of a problem now because of, uh, you know, it's uh, sort of uh, is politically incorrect to call it the master it's equation because then what's the slave equation? Oh, because of the master and the... And yeah. the slave. We have to come up with another name for this. Wow, okay. <laughs> there you go. Find another name. <laughs> Yeah, you Good. guys at MIT also have these lists of uh, terms that are not allowed to use? Uh, I'm afraid that hasn't come up yet, but uh, yeah, uh, but we, I mean, yeah, we should be careful. I haven't heard that one, the master equation, that's uh, <laughs> so. But the brown bag, for example, that's one that you're not allowed to use anymore. <laughs> I've seen okay. that for okay, we're getting bad. We're getting an bad. official Let's document from the University of Michigan. I can send it to you, Peter. Really? Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Yeah. Brown bag and also black and white. That's really bad, apparently. Hmm. Yeah, and, and a few other like that. Oh, that that's a little bit goes farther than I thought. I, I thought master equation would be a bit obscure, but uh, <laughs> uh, but and I'm not even quite sure why it's called that. I mean, it, in English, it was originally the Pauli master equation, but I, uh, I have to read what, obviously, Pauli wrote in German, so I don't know whether it's the Meistergleichung or, or, or something else like that. I don't know. Um, um, it sounds odd, even in German. Yes, Me Meistergleichung. Yeah. <laughs> Die Anwendung der Meistergleichungen. <laughs> Right, from the master. Okay, so I guess we should start the lecture. Okay, please, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's a, it's a real pleasure to have with us today Professor Mei Hong from the Department of Chemistry of the uh, MIT. Uh, and uh, before presenting Mei, let me remind you that uh, uh, during the talk, uh, please keep all your uh, microphones mute. And we are going to have a chance for a lively question and answer session in the end where each of you will be able to mute on turn, in turn and, and ask the question. So please keep all your questions to the end. Uh, so uh, Professor Mei Ong uh, uh, is a solid state NMR scientist. Uh, she started as a career in uh, Mount Holyoke uh, College. This is one of my uh, favorite Gordon uh, conference uh, site. Then she did a PhD with Alex Pines in uh, Berkeley and a short postdoc with uh, Bob Griffin at MIT. Uh, and uh, after that, she started her individual, uh, her independent career uh, in uh, Iowa State University. Uh, where she was promoted very, very quickly to a full professor after, I, I believe, just five years uh, as a faculty. Uh, and she stayed there till 2014 when she returned to MIT as a professor in the Department of Chemistry. So May's uh, research revolves around uh, studies of uh, biological uh, structures, proteins, especially membrane proteins, and also uh, proteins that uh, uh, make uh, fibrils and uh, other such structures. 
She's using solid state NMR techniques because uh, for these uh, structures, uh, other NMR techniques are not available due to the uh, uh, slow tumbling rates of the proteins in these structures. And, uh, you know, since I, I come from the Weizmann Institute, where a, there's a big tradition and a very old tradition of magnetic resonance research, I know that in this field, there are two types of people. There are the ones who develop methods, and there are the ones who use these methods in order to generate uh, new information, for example, in biology or material science. And actually, the best people, the leaders in the field, are the ones who are combining both uh, methods development and uh, uh, new scientific research. And this is where Mei Hong uh, is. Uh, she's uh, developing a lot of methodology for uh, magic angle spinning, solid state NMR, and other techniques like that. And she's uh, very well known for his usage of these methods uh, for solving the structures of membrane proteins, uh, especially the influenza virus and other viruses, including last year the SARS-CoV-2 virus, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the membrane proteins in this virus. She's uh, looking at amyloid fibrils. She's, she's looking at uh, cell walls and other such structures. And she's uh, publishing a very high profile research on all of these topics, which is quite impressive. Uh, May received many awards uh, for uh, uh, work, I will just mention a few of her awards. Uh, the 2021 Nakanishi Award of the American Chemical Society. Uh, she was in 2018 a, a, a Shaul Fellow at the Tel Aviv University. She received the Lockean Prize of the uh, uh, Experimental NMR Conference in 2014. And in 2012, she received uh, the Young Investigative Prize of the Protein uh, Society. I actually heard her uh, when she gave the uh, prize-related talk, and I was very, very impressed. And I'm sure that her talk today will be just as good as, as the talk that I heard then. No pressure, mate. Uh, <laughs> okay, so with that, I will stop, and I will uh, uh, let me share a screen. Uh, the title of her talk is Structures and Dynamics of Membrane Proteins in Infectious Diseases. So please, May. Um, thank you, Gilad, for the <clears throat> kind introduction. Uh, let me share my uh, screen here. So, um, and of course, for uh, also thank you, the organizers, for the invitation to speak, to speak at this uh, really nice um, protein folding and dynamics webinar series. Uh, so today, um, I'd like to tell you um, about my group's studies of the structure and dynamics of, uh, let me just hold on, uh, of membrane proteins, uh, particularly membrane ion channels of the influenza virus and SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus. Um, so we're interested in these uh, channels and transporters from a very fundamental uh, point of view we would like to know just how does protein structure and dynamics actually enable ion conduction and transport of uh, all sorts of polar substrates across the lipid bilayer. Now to uh, answer these questions first, let's think about just the difference between channels and transporters. Uh, according to uh, textbooks, um, ion channels conduct ions down their electrochemical uh, gradient in response to uh, external stimuli such as low pH, uh, and voltage by uh, opening a gate. Now, this uh, gate uh, typically consists of protein side chains. So in order for ion conduction to occur, uh, there needs to be protein side chain dynamics. Now, transporters, which I will also touch on a little bit, uh, does something different. Um, transporters ultimately open to the two sides of the lipid bilayer uh, to pick up and release uh, substrates. Uh, and this alternating access requires um, large-scale protein conformational dynamics, uh, which would typically involve uh, backbones. So in order to understand the mechanism of actions of channels and transporters, one needs to know not only the structures of these proteins in lipid bilayers, uh, but also side chain and uh, backbone dynamics. And in addition for these uh, water permeated uh, pores or channels and transporters, uh, the solvent dynamics is also of interest. 
And uh, I would like to show you that uh, with solid state and MR spectroscopy, one can uh, get to all these uh, detailed uh, information. So um, my lab has focused on the study of virus uh, ion channels, also called viral porings. Uh, these viral porings are small, oligomeric, uh, and uh, relatively hydrophobic membrane proteins. And the best known member of the viral pouring family is really this uh, influenza A virus IAV, uh, M2 protein. But of course, COVID-19 has also turned our attention very rapidly to the equivalent viral pouring in the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, uh, the E protein. Uh, and so today I will tell you uh, our studies of both uh, M2 uh, and the E protein. Now first, about the influenza uh, M2 protein. M2 actually has two functions. It is not only a uh, proton channel, but also is a protein uh, membrane scission uh, machinery. Uh, so in terms of the proton channel activity, this is manifested early on in the virus life cycle after a uh, flu virus is endocytosed into the host cell. Uh, this, this M2 protein responds to the low pH environment of the endosome to conduct protons into the virion. That acidification uh, of the virion causes the release of the viral ribonucleic protein complex uh, into the host cell. So this is a process called uncoating. So M2 is an acid activated proton channel. It is a tetrameric uh, proton channel. Now later on in the virus life cycle, when a new virus is assembled and ready to bud, uh, M2 acts again by cutting the virus lipid envelope from the cell uh, membrane, the plasma membrane. And so this is a membrane scission uh, function. Now these two functions of M2 are separated into different parts of the protein. Uh, the proton channel activity is mostly contained in the transmembrane domain, uh, which contains uh, the proton selective, uh, selective apparatus, uh, just a single histidine residue. It also contains the gating apparatus, which is a single tryptophan. And these two aromatic residues are separated just by one helical turn. Um, and uh, this uh, proton channel um, is also blocked by antiviral drugs, a mantidine family of antiviral drugs, uh, except that now with the uh, a single um, serine 31N mutation in most uh, circulating flu viruses, these drugs are no longer effective. Um, now the membrane scission function is actually uh, localized in a different part of the protein in a cytoplasmic domain. And I won't talk about that uh, today. I will just focus on the uh, membrane, uh, the proton channel function as uh, uh, highlighted in the transmembrane domain. So, all right, so for many years, uh, two proton conduction models have been put forward uh, to explain M2's activity. Uh, the first model, uh, proposed model, was the water wire model, which says that histidine, this proton selective histidine, plays a relatively passive role at low pH when multiple histidine rings are protonated and become cationic, then electrostatic repulsion opens this constriction of the channel, which then allows a continuous water wire to be established over which protons can hop by the Grotus mechanism. So in this model, uh, water molecules are really doing the proton conduction. And the rate limiting step of this water wire model is the fact that protons have to hop across a ring of several histidine, cationic histidines, uh, whose uh, energy barrier or potential of mean force have been calculated early on by Greg Wolf and coworkers. Now, it turns out that biochemical observations of the hydrogen deuterium isotope effect, uh, as well as a saturation current, are somewhat at odds with this uh, water wire model. Uh, so instead, Larry Pinto and Bill DeGrado proposed a, a shuttle model, which says that histidines actively participate uh, in this proton relay by protonation and deprotonation. Uh, and in this model, the rate limiting step would be the conformational change of the histidine that is necessary to generate the initial state to carry on the next proton relays. And that um, conformational change might be tautomerization or might be ring flips of some sort. So to determine or to identify which model is correct for M2, we decided to measure the histidine NMR spectra in detail. We know that the histidine nitrogen and carbon chemical shifts are very sensitive to the side chain chemical structure uh, of this uh, aromatic uh, amino acid. Uh, whether you have a, a N epsilon 2 protonated tau tautomer or N, N delta 1 protonated pi tautomer, both neutral, or whether you have a cationic 
uh, charged histidine create very clear chemical shift differences. Uh, and so we uh, put these, this labeled histidine in the transmembrane uh, AM2 peptide bound to a virus mimetic lipid membrane containing cholesterol and various phospholipids uh, as sphingomyelin. And we measured uh, the histidine NMR spectra as a function of pH. So you can see here, for example, at very high pH of 8.5, we can uh, very well reserve, uh, resolve the unprotonated nitrogen signals coming from the tau and pi tautomers at about 250 ppm from the protonated nitrogen signals at about 160 ppm. And these chemical shifts can be assigned readily using uh, 2D correlation spectra. Uh, but if you go to very low pH of 4.5, there's only a single uh, broad uh, protonated nitrogen uh, peak at about 180 ppm, which corresponds to cationic uh, histidine. Uh, and the carbon chemical shifts uh, are con completely consistent with the nitrogen uh, observation. Uh, moreover, we know that at high pH, the, the tau and pi tautomers uh, coexist uh, within the same channel because we can see cross peaks between them. Uh, they exist at about three to one uh, ratio. So by titrating uh, the, uh, his, the samples as a function of pH, we uh, can uh, identify the chemical structure of these histidines. But what about the histidine dynamics in terms of both the proton transfer dynamics as well as potential side chain conformational dynamics? Uh, to answer that question, we need to go to high temperature and observe the, uh, measure the NMR spectra again closely. And you can see now uh, in the M15 NMR spectra at a high temperature, in the acidic pH, which is relevant uh, for the endosome uh, environment between about five and six, we now can see uh, average uh, nitrogen chemical shifts average between the limiting value of fully unprotonated N and fully protonated nitrogen. Instead, now we see chemical shifts at about 213 ppm and another value at about 185 or 190 ppm. And these can be assigned to the uh, exchange N delta one and N epsilon two. And moreover, this exchange is between uh, among all three possible chemical structures of histidine involving the tau uh, tautomer pi as well as the cationic form. So, so the observation of these uh, exchange average chemical shifts is a direct proof that histidines are undergoing rapid interconversion uh, between the protonated, biprotonated, and the neutral states. And moreover, by uh, calculating uh, assimilating the line width of the exchange peaks, uh, these relatively broad line width, we can derive a proton exchange rate of about 400,000 times uh, per second. So we're having, we're seeing microsecond time scale in the conversion between the uh, charged and neutral state. So this is a direct evidence of the shuttling uh, mechanism. Uh, moreover, the exchange partner, the proton exchange partner of histidine is water molecules rather than another histidine, because we can see very clear uh, imidazole nitrogen correlation signals with water protons at about 5 ppm. Uh, so that means we have a mixed hydrogen bonded chain between histidine and water molecules. Finally, uh, we can measure the side chain dynamics by measuring uh, dipolar couplings of these imidazole bonds, for example, this C delta 2 H bond and the C gamma 2 nitrogen N delta 1 bond. And you can see that uh, summarized here, at low pH, we find that these dipolar couplings are averaged by motion by about 20%, order parameter 0.8, while at high pH, these dipolar couplings are in their rigid limit, indicating that these imidazoles are fully immobilized. Uh, these low pH order parameters translate to a relatively simple motional geometry of a two-site jump around the C beta C gamma bond by a torsion angle change of about 45 degrees. And that that ring motion uh, would support the view that these uh, rings are, are reorienting in order to uh, create the initial confirmation to carry on the next proton relay, which is part of the uh, shuttle uh, mechanism. So putting all of these spectroscopic uh, observations together, we can propose this structural transformation cycle uh, for histidine to carry out a proton relay or proton conduction. Uh, so if you start with a tau, neutral tau tautomer facing the low pH endosome along, uh, in the end terminus, this tau tautomer can pick up a proton from the endosome to create the biprotonated cationic histidine, which then can lose a proton through its uh, C-terminal facing N-epsilon-2 to create this transient 
pi tautomer. And then that pi tautomer can revert back to the initial spa, uh, state through either tautomerization, as I depict here, or through ring reorientation. Uh, and uh, what we don't know at this point is whether these two processes are separated or perhaps go together. Uh, but the idea is to generate initial, uh, the initial state for the next uh, proton uh, relay. So with this, uh, these results, we uh, were inspired to you know, have an animation made by a medical artist to depict uh, one of these uh, conformational uh, changes, which is the ring flip or ring reorientation. And you can see how that uh, ring reorientation uh, occurring on a microsecond time scale uh, to cause the dipolar coupling averaging uh, can relay the protons from the hydronium ions from the n terminus to the downstream water molecules into uh, the virion. Now you might ask, well, what uh, makes how uh, what makes the water molecules reach this histidine uh, in the first place? So we imagined at the time around 2010 that there must be some kind of uh, conformational change involving the all four uh, the four helix bundle so that the pathway could become more open for water molecules to reach this at this point. And the evidence for this four helix bundle re rearrangement only became clear in the last uh, couple of years when we uh, captured it in uh, uh, our NMR spectra. Now with the sidechain dynamics now becoming relatively clear, we asked the question, what is the proton uh, protonation equilibria of the histidine tetrad? Uh, and so this is a, a question of measuring the uh, pKa, the, uh, the acid dissociation constants. And there are really four pKa's because you have four uh, copies. Uh, this is a tetrameric channel. Uh, and so to measure, determine these pKa's, we uh, measured the uh, M15 NMR spectra of the histidines in a quantitative way. And we do this at low temperature so that there's no proton transfer dynamics nor uh, side chain motion. Um, and so we uh, observe the relative intensity of the unprotonated N nitrogen band relative to the protonated NH band. This relative intensity uh, depends on the, or reflects the uh, concentration ratio between the neutral and cationic histidines, all right? So, so that concentration ratio uh, can be related to the four pKa's uh, through this analytical uh, equation uh, by writing out the equilibrium uh, reactions. And so if you have enough uh, different pH samples, uh, five samples here, then you have an overdetermined problem to, to extract all four pKa's. Uh, and so you can see uh, shown here is the titration curve uh, in this case, we measured in our very first study, influenza AM2 transmembrane peptide, again, bound to that virus mimetic cholesterol-rich uh, lipid bilayer. Uh, and uh, the y-axis uh, shows the neutral to cationic histidine ratio. So high value indicates more neutral histidines, a uh, low value indicates more cationic histidines. So as you can see, uh, as you go from high pH to low pH, your uh, this ratio concentrate concentration ratio drops, and you can fit uh, the observations uh, into the uh, that analytical equation to extract the pKa's. Uh, and so, for the influenza AM2 transmembrane peptide, we resolved all four pKa's. And if you look at these values, by the time you get to slightly below neutral pH, we already have uh, two out of four histidine rings uh, protonated. To you, so you have a plus two tetrad. Now the third protonation event does not happen until relatively low pH of around uh, five. And uh, then you have the fourth one at very low pH 4.2. So, so these, uh, the resolution of these four pKa's can go on to give us more interesting information. First of all, these pKa's give us the uh, population of the possible all five uh, tetrads, uh, starting from all neutral, so zero state, two plus one, two plus two, all the way to plus four. And if you look at these population curves, their intersections are correspond to these pKa's uh, values. And so now that we know the populations of these tetra states, charged states at different pH, you can come back and think about the electrophysiological uh, measurement of proton current, so I, as a function of pH. And these were measured by Larry Pinto and uh, Bob Lamb and Northwestern. Uh, they did this under, of course, the controlled voltage. Um, and, uh, what, and if you think about the, uh, the proton current, it depends on the uh, population of the different tetrads, as well as the single channel uh, current 
and proton uh, and the uh, uh, open probability. So this G sub I with an average bar is the time average single channel conductivity. So now that we know the population N from the NMR determined PKAs, we can then uh, derive or deduce the time average single channel uh, conductivity. So uh, fitting the uh, proton current by these population uh, curves, we can uh, find that the plus three charge tetrad has the highest time average single channel conductivity. It is about three times more able to conduct protons compared to the neighboring uh, plus two charge state and about an order of magnitude uh, more potent than the plus four state. And we think this makes a lot of sense uh, because the plus two charge state, um, that tetramer is not quite open enough to allow proton conduction or allow water molecules to reach that histidine, while the plus four state has too much charge against the incoming protons, uh, and that would uh, slow down uh, the proton conduction. So, so we think the plus uh, three charge state is the best poise uh, for uh, proton conduction. So uh, this insight is really uh, useful uh, for thinking about how um, the, the, the histidine um, uh, proton carry, uh, relays proton into the virus. Now, with that information, we went on to ask uh, the question, uh, what about the influenza B virus? Uh, so it turns out, although influenza A is responsible for all historical pandemic uh, flu, influenza B is actually a relatively common in seasonal flu. In every spring uh, of the, uh, uh, every winter season uh, in the spring months, uh, B infection actually dominates over A. And in most uh, the last couple of years, influenza B sometimes surges already in the fall. Uh, so if you look at the amino acid sequence, of BM2's transmembrane domain. Although histidine and tryptophan are conserved, uh, the rest of the uh, channel um, pore actually are completely different in amino acid sequence, and particularly uh, facing the pore, instead of having uh, the, the um, hydrophobic valine alanine glycine residues as in AM2, you now have relatively polar serine uh, residues. There are three interesting uh, serine, or I call a serine triplet facing the pore. And uh, if you look at the functional uh, data for electrophysiological uh, measurement in a wool site, uh, measured using a uh, two electrode voltage clamp experiment, uh, you find that although AM2 and BM2 share the same forward or inward current under the suitable low pH out and uh, high pH in condition, when you switch the pH gradient uh, from the, you know, to the low pH in and out is high pH, you find that AM2 uh, is unable to conduct any protons in the reverse direction, while BM2 is able uh, to conduct a moderate amount of uh, reverse current. And so that uh, is depicted here. So AM2 is strictly inward rectifying uh, with the suitable um, pH, uh, uh, acidic pH on the outside and uh, neutral pH inside, both proteins can conduct protons inward. But when you switch the pH uh, gradient or proton concentration gradient, only BM2 can conduct protons in the reverse direction. So there are some, uh, this, there's this important functional difference. Uh, to answer the uh, mechanistic reason for these differences, we um, started measuring the BM2's uh, you know, histidine's protonation behavior. And here, right away, just from the simple M15 NMR spectra, you can see already BM2's uh, histidine 19 uh, preserve its unprotonated nitrogen signal down to very low pH of 5.5 or 4.5. And this is very different, qualitatively different uh, from AM2's histidine situation. So in other words, the neutral state uh, is favored or stabilized in BM2. If you uh, convert these intensity information to PKAs, indeed you find BM2's PKAs are depressed by about a 1.5 uh, to one pH unit uh, to com compare to AM2. So again, high value uh, in this chart in the, along the y-axis means more neutral state and low value indicates more cationic uh, history. So, uh, so this observation is intriguing. We uh, um, at, the fir at first, uh, before we did the measurement, we thought having these uh, polar serines, if anything, should favor the delivery of, you know, protons or hydronium ions to that histidine. So why, you know, is this uh, uh, proton selective histidine more neutral compared to AM2? Uh, then if you think about it, uh, that neutral state could be favored if you have accelerated uh, proton dissociation. In other words, the K-off rate 
uh, shown here in the uh, acid dissociation constant expression, the K-off rate might be increased. Uh, so then you can ask why would the K-off rate be increased? So if you look at compare the two um, AM2, BM2 transmembrane sequence closely, you realize there is actually a peripheral or surface associated a second histidine in BM2, which is absent uh, in AM2. So this uh, surface uh, titratable histidine could potentially uh, relay protons from the central proton selective histidine, while the corresponding constitutively cationic arginine would not be able to do so in AM2. So to test that idea, we mutated uh, the uh, wild type BM2 second histidine to an alanine and measured the pKa again. Uh, and now you can see at pH 6.5, indeed the mutant has a lower unprotonated nitrogen intensity, indicating that now the proton, uh, uh, you know, uh, dissociation equilibrium has now shifted towards the AM2 uh, phenotype. So indeed, now you can see the mutant data is shown in red. At high pH, the uh, values are lower, indicating that now you have more cationic histidine. So this uh, uh, simple mutation revert the BM2 double histidine uh, uh, phenotype to the AM2 single histidine uh, phenotype. So this means that even though that second histidine is quite far away from the central proton selective histidine, the, its presence actually affects the protonation equilibrium of this uh, channel of BM2 channel. Now, a second residue that has an impact on the histidine protonation equilibrium is the gating residue tryptophan. This tryptophan exists in all um, M2 channels, uh, AM2, BM2, and in fact, there's uh, influenza C, CM2. Um, and uh, now in the wild type AM2 uh, peptide, so back to AM2, if you look at the low pH uh, spectrum, this is the 2D carbon correlation spectrum of uh, histidine. So we're observing the histidine signal. And if you go to high enough magnetic fields to resolve all the signals, we actually could resolve uh, two, two signals, which we can assign to a cat, cat, uh, plus two state and plus three state of the charged um, tetrad. So we call these cat two and cat three. And the plus two state at the, this particular pH dominates in the wild type situation. Uh, but if we uh, remove that gating tryptophan and convert it to a smaller phenylalanine ring, so now this is a, a gating deficient channel, now you can see that the histidine signal shifts predominantly to this uh, plus three charge state, which at uh, the cat three state, indicating that when in the absence of a good gate, uh, protons can now uh, protonate histidine from the reverse direction, uh, which is not possible with the uh, fully, you know, wild type AM2. So, so this tryptophan also changes uh, the uh, protonation equilibrium of, of histidine or the, uh, the, the removal of the tryptophan affects the histidine protonation equilibrium. So when we then take this uh, mutant uh, in a wild type situation, uh, add a mantidine, which we know by then to bind to the N-terminal region, particularly near the serine 31, uh, then in the wild type situation, the histidine, even though you're at a low pH, the histidine signal uh, corresponds to the neutral state tau and pi tautomer, very little intensity in the uh, charge state. And this is completely consistent with the expectation that amantidine blocks proton delivery uh, to this histidine so that even though the ambient pH is low, the histidine behaves uh, in a neutral state. Um, now, if you take the, the W41F mutant, and allow the drug to still bind to the N-terminal pore, you can see spectroscopically at low pH, uh, in the presence of this drug, now the histidine signal uh, is about uh, equally divided between the tau form and the plus three charge tetrad, indicating that now you have basically a reverse protonated um, leaky channel from the C-terminus where protons can access the histidine while the mantidine blocks the passage of protons uh, from this uh, north side or N-terminal side. And so uh, these, uh, this mutation then basically allows us to tease out the impact of the tryptophan gate on the protonation uh, equilibria of that central proton selective histidine and these results. Uh, so combining the BM2 uh, double histidine motif uh, study and the AM2 uh, single histidine motif and uh, with and without the mutation, uh, we can see how uh, these surrounding residues impact the central histidine's protonation. And you can actually see the W41F um, mutation 
compared to the uh, BM2's second histidine has the same impact on you know, the PKA titration curves. They both uh, create this accelerated, well, um, I, I, let me just step back, and removing the tryptophan gate accelerates reverse protonation and low pH and uh, decelerates uh, proton dissociation at high pH. So you have a steeper titration curve. And in BM2, the C-terminal second histidine accelerates forward deprotonation, also creating a, a steeper titration curve. Uh, so, so now, uh, so these studies told us a lot about the um, side chain proton transfer dynamics around the central proton selective histidine. Uh, so now coming back to the question of what about the uh, overall protein backbone motion, uh, and does that play a role in the, the proton conduction in AM2 and BM2? Um, so at this point, uh, crystal structure, uh, very high resolution crystal structures solved by Bill de Grado and coworkers um, have told us by about 2017 that AM2 adopts um, two relatively distinct backbone conformations or four helix bundle conformations. What they found from their, you know, one Anstrom resolution crystal structures is that at high pH, the uh, N-terminal vestibule of the channel is relatively spacious, um, relatively open, you might say, while at low pH in the activated, activated state of the channel, the N-terminus become relatively shut, closed, while the C-terminus is wide open. So based on these two distinct uh, structures, they propose a transporter model for AM2. So now remember transporters uh, supposedly alternately open to the two sides of the lipid bilayer to conduct ions or polar substrates. And this transporter mo model would explain why um, AM2 can only conduct protons in an inward direction uh, and not in the reverse uh, direction. So uh, we decided to take a look at our NMR spectra more closely and more, uh, moreover to deduce, uh, the, to see if there are signs of the um, dynamics uh, between these two conformations. Um, and so, uh, and we fortunately are able to resolve two sets of chemical shifts in this W41F mutant of AM2. These two sets of chemical shifts labeled initially as X and Y um, have, uh, uh, are, um, the same chemical shifts up and down the pH, but their intensities uh, change are exclusively controlled uh, by pH. So as you go down to low pH, the X state uh, dominates, and at high pH, uh, the Y state dominates. And we can see these two sets of chemical shifts for many transmembrane uh, residues, so it's not a local effect. Now, these were resolved at low uh, temperature, uh, but if we go to high temperature and allow protein uh, dynamics uh, to occur, then you can see at acidic pH, where the plus two and plus three charge tetrad dominate, then these two sets of chemical shifts merge uh, and start to become uh, averaged, uh, but the averaging uh, does not happen at a very fast rate because the line width is not particularly uh, sharp. And so what this means is that the protein at this temperature is undergoing conformational inner conversion between these two states at a rate which roughly matches the shift difference, chemical shift difference of about 400 uh, times per second or several hundred times per second. And this is very nicely uh, consistent with the proton conduction, overall proton conduction rate of AM2, which is less than a thousand times per second. So uh, basically this means that the rate limiting step of proton conduction is this four helix bundle rearrangement between these two conformations. Uh, and so, so that's uh, very in very good agreement with the initial, this transporter model proposed by uh, Grado and uh, Klein. So, uh, so now that is, uh, that transporter model is consistent with the inward rectifying nature of AM2. But we, as I mentioned, BM2 actually can conduct a small amount of reverse current. So it's interesting, it will be interesting to examine if BM2 has the same kind of overall conformational dynamics. Uh, to answer this question, we determine the BM2 structure in lipid bilayers uh, completely by solid state NMR. So what Shiva Mandela in my group did was to express this BM2 construct that contains uh, both the transmembrane domain uh, and a portion of the cytoplasmic region, and then incorporated this peptide into lipid bilayers and measured the spectra at both low pH and high pH corresponding to uh, the, the open and closed uh, states. 
And by you know, doing 2D and 3D correlation experiments, uh, he is able to uh, resolve and assign all the chemical shifts. Now, these chemical shifts tell us that uh, the transmembrane domain is alpha helical, but more importantly, um, these chemical shifts tell us that between the high pH and low pH state, there's very little uh, conformational difference. So there is not the situation of AM2 where you can actually resolve two sets of uh, conformations. Uh, so, so that's uh, one piece of interesting information. And the second uh, question then is how are these you know, uh, secondary structures or how these alpha helices actually packed in the lipid membrane? Uh, and so this is a question of quaternary structure for these oligomeric helical bundles. And that's actually not simple to determine by NMR. So we, uh, in this case, are able to determine both the helix orientation uh, as well as the interhelical separation uh, using uh, NMR. And the helix orientation comes from measuring the NH bond uh, uh, orientations or through dipolar couplings under the condition of uniaxial rotation, while the interhelical separation came from measuring uh, carbon fluorine dipolar couplings uh, using Redor NMR technique. So briefly, the helix orientation is measured under the condition of uh, overall helix bundle uh, uniaxial rotation, which exists uh, for BM2. Uh, and so we measure emotionally average dipolar couplings, which depends on the NH bond orientation relative to the bilayer normal. And we can do this measurement in a site resolved fashion by you know, nitrogen carbon correlation. So at the end of the day, we can tease out these NH dipolar couplings uh, as a function uh, for the various residues. And we get this periodic dipolar waves which tell us about the uh, helix tilt angle. And it turns out uh, the data indicates that the low pH state of the sample has a slightly larger tilt angle. So basically, as the channel activates, uh, the helices become uh, more tilted. So that's one piece of important constraint. The second piece of constraint is interhelical separations. And here, we would like to incorporate fluorinated residues. So there are two native phenylalanines, which we can tag with uh, parafloral labels. Uh, we mix this with carbon-13 label protein, and we can measure carbon fluorine interhelical uh, distances using Redor, where the idea is to measure these carbon signals that are close to the fluorine spins. So these are the Redor difference intensities. By uh, measuring these uh, Redor spectra as a function of the carbon fluorine uh, recoupling pulse uh, um, duration or mixing time, we can also quantify these uh, distances. And when you see a slow dipolar dephasing or uh, more gradual dephasing, that corresponds to a longer distance. And what we found basically is that the low pH situation gives us longer distances by one or two enzymes for the various uh, carbon-13 label sites. And so now if you combine the chemical shift derived torsion angles uh, with the helix tilt angles, uh, and interhelical separations, we can obtain these high resolution structures of BM2 in the high pH uh, closed state and low pH open state. And if you look from the C terminus uh, into the pore, indeed, we have a more spacious pore for this uh, central you know, histidine region uh, for the uh, activated state of the protein. And this more spacious pore can be seen in the water permeated you know, uh, pore diameter as illustrated in these whole plots. Now, if you look at BM2, you can see that the pore widens in a relatively uniform manner uh, throughout the helix, uh, up and down the helix axis uh, from the closed uh, high pH state to the low pH state. Um, so it's a uniform uh, expansion of the pore. And that's different from the AM2 situation as derived from the crystal structures where you can see actually the pore diameter closes a bit uh, in the end terminus and opens more widely in the C-terminal region upon going to the low pH. So, so a BM2 activates really uh, actually differently from AM2. And um, spectroscopically, we can also measure water transfer to the carbon spectrum of the protein to prove that indeed at low pH, there's more magnetization transfer from water. Uh, so the channel is wider and is more hydrated. Uh, and so combining both the side chain information and the backbone information, we have a very clear case of AM2 having a, a um, transporter-like backbone motion to support inward only proton conduction, while BM2 has a scissor-like motion, what I call scissor motion, which is a straightforward tilt uh, opening of the uh, helices uh, and the separation of the helices to allow bidirectional proton current. And we think that this uh, different backbone uh, motional mechanism 
ultimately comes from the uh, different amino acid sequence of the protein. And this difference is manifested at two um, levels. One is BM2 has that unique uh, double histidine motif, HXXXW, and then XXXH again, which allows um, proton relay in the uh, reverse direction into the channel, as well as the forward dissociation of protons from that central histidine. And at the second uh, level, there is a central glycine residue in AM2, which allows this kind of a hinge motion. Uh, and that glycine is replaced by a serine residue in BM2. So your, the helix, uh, transmembrane helix is basically unable to do this uh, interesting uh, transported motion. So that's our current understanding of the origin of the different protein dynamics between, between BM2 and AM2. Now, the uh, determination of the high resolution structure of BM2 in lipid bilayers by NMR also allowed us to look at the water dynamics in some detail. After all, water wire has to relay the proton to the histidines uh, to, to then shuttle into, uh, to be shuttled into the virion. And so we teamed up recently with Adam Willard's group to conduct a joint NMR and uh, molecular di dynamic simulation study of water dynamics in the BM2 pore. And a number of uh, experiments and simulations basically told us that in the low pH acid um, uh, acidic state of BM2, the channel con contains about twice as many water molecules compared to the uh, high pH situation. So we can see that uh, from water transferred NMR spectra. These channel pore water molecules are more uh, dynamic, uh, both in the rotational sense uh, and in the translational sense. Uh, and uh, uh, MD simulations also indicate that these water molecules have hydrogen, a fewer hydrogen bond bottlenecks uh, at low pH. Now, very excitingly to me, what we found using a special protein carbon detected uh, water uh, spin log experiment is that these water molecules in the pore is actually not completely isotropic or not randomly oriented. Instead, the water molecules have residual orientational uh, order or anisotropy as manifested in these uh, dipolar oscillations. Uh, and these oscillations are different between low pH and high pH. At low pH, this residual order parameter is a little bit higher, about 6% and a high pH, this is 4%. And so basically the water molecules are slightly better aligned, better oriented at low pH in the conducting state. And that's uh, confirmed by uh, Adam Willard's uh, group's uh, MD simulations. And what they uh, can uh, show is that the water molecules C terminal to that histidine preferentially point the oxygen towards the histidine, which is now cationic, while the N-terminal water molecules preferentially point the oxygen down to that histidine. Uh, and so um, this uh, is uh, basically the, um, so we think that this preferential alignment uh, facilitates um, uh, water uh, conduction uh, or the high, uh, proton conduction to, towards uh, this um, histidine. So in the remaining time, I would like to uh, briefly uh, tell you how we take, took our expertise for uh, solving the structure of the M2 to the study of the SARS-CoV-2 viral porine E. So the SARS-CoV-2 virus has only three membrane proteins, the spike protein, the membrane protein, and the envelope protein. Uh, now, the, these three membrane proteins orchestrate their actions uh, at different stages of the virus life cycle, as you probably all know. The spike protein is the one for recognizing cell surface ACE2 receptors to allow the virus entry uh, into the cell. Now, once inside, the viral RNA has to be replicated and transcribed. Uh, and then the virus, new virus proteins and RNAs are then assembled at this particular cellular compartment called ERGIC, or endoplasmic reticulum Golgi intermediate compartment. That assembly is done by the M, M protein. Now, um, the uh, E proteins function at this point is to make sure that the assembly, the assembled virus buds into the ergic lumen so that the new virus can be exocytosed out of the cell. So, so E first is responsible for this virus budding, but then a second function of E is to conduct cations. It actually non-selectively conducts sodium, potassium, and calcium, but the only cation that has a significant concentration uh, difference uh, between the ergic and the cell, uh, uh, cytoplasm, is the calcium. So uh, this calcium conduction activity actually has been uh, linked to the um, virus ability to uh, stimulate the infl inflammation response uh, to the virus. 
And so if you can block this E uh, channel, calcium channel, then one has a potential antiviral drug. And hexamethylene amyloride has been documented in the literature as an E uh, inhibitor. So we decided to uh, quickly determine, as quickly as we can, the, determine the structure of the E protein during the pandemic. So in the first uh, few months of the COVID-19, we uh, um, expressed this E protein's transmembrane domain. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2 version of E has the identical sequence as SARS-CoV-1 version, which uh, caused an epidemic in 2003. Um, what was known in the literature by this uh, time is that this E assembles into a pentameric form in uh, detergent, various detergent in, uh, mimetic, uh, membrane mimetic environment, um, but the exact structure was not known. Solution NMR studies in uh, different uh, detergents gave inconclusive uh, results. And so we, of course, would like to study this in lipid bilayers. Uh, we use both bottle membranes such as the NPC, the MPG, uh, as well as ergic mimetic membranes containing cholesterol and a whole a range of phospholipids. And as you can see from these 1D spectrum that uh, this uh, res line width is very high, very uh, line width is very narrow, the resolution is very high, and the intensities are relatively insensitive to temperature, indicating that this protein is uh, well immobilized in lipid bilayers. So we can assign all the chemical shifts uh, very well, and the result indicates that this E transmembrane domain is um, alpha helical, but um, the C beta chemical shifts indicate a small amount of helical disorder in the middle of the transmembrane region because the C beta uh, chemical shifts are relatively um, inconclusive or is not, uh, secondary shift is not particularly uh, negative. So keep that in mind. And uh, to determine the oligomeric packing of these helices, we find that because of the uh, immobilization of the protein, we cannot actually measure the helix orientation, but we can use the fluorine uh, carbon redor strategy uh, to measure the interhelical separation. Uh, and in, in addition, we can also measure the water versus lipid facing direction of these residues. Uh, so the uh, interhelical separation is measured using the same approach. And I will skip uh, this slide in the interest of time. Uh, and you can see here, taking advantage of three regularly spaced phenylalanines, uh, we can uh, measure these 2D redor spectra. And the difference uh, spectrum shown in red uh, gives us the carbon sites that are close uh, to the fluorine in the next molecule. And we can resolve these fluorine uh, signals and assign them to some extent using fluorine carbon 2D correlation. We can quantify the read or intensities uh, to get the distances from the carbons uh, to the fluorines. Uh, and to supplement uh, these uh, fluorine carbon contacts, we also can measure the water uh, contact or uh, water to protein correlation uh, experiments in these uh, hydration maps um, to find out which residues are well hydrated and pore facing and which residues are dry and lipid facing. And so here the hydration gradient is shown in this chart. Uh, we find that the N terminal region is well hydrated, C terminal is modestly hydrated, and the vast middle is relatively dry, but some residues are better hydrated than others. For example, valine 25 and leucine 31. So that becomes important in our structure calculation. Now, a reverse experiment is to transfer the lipid polarization to the protein uh, and find out, uh, 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 give us the information that these phenylalanine residues are uh, lipid facing as shown by these high uh, lipid transferred aromatic uh, signals. So um, taking all of these informations into helical carbon fluorine read or data, uh, water to lipid face, water and lipid facing information, as well as the uh, secondary structure, we can calculate the uh, five helix bundle structure of E. And shown here is uh, this uh, um, uh, result of the uh, calculation. So this is a 2.1 Enstrom structure. Uh, you can see that this uh, helical bundle is relatively tight and uh, very long, 35 Enstrom long. Uh, across uh, the, from residue about 14 uh, to 34. And the pore diameter is tight um, from uh, re uh, residue uh, helix I to I plus two. If you consider just the alpha C alpha separations, we're looking at about 11 to 14 Anstrom uh, separations. Um, the pore facing residues are highly hydrophobic, leucines, alanines, and so on, and valines. 
except for an N-terminal asparagine 15, which is the only uh, polar residues. We think this residue might be important uh, for cation conduction, calcium conduction. This five helix bundle is held together by an aromatic gate of three phenylalanine residues, which uh, bridge the helix helix interface. It's also held together by these uh, methyl rich leucine and valine nice leucine uh, residues through these uh, van der Waals interactions. So uh, it's interesting that the SARS CoV 2 viral porine E looks very different from the corresponding viral porines of influenza, M2 here, and HIV, uh, VPU. Both of these uh, viral porines are much wider, more spacious, as well as uh, less elongated. So we don't know what this exactly means to SARS CoV 2's virus pathogenicity. I would also point out that the lipid bilayer bound structure of E looks quite different from the detergent micelle structure as reported by porous and coworkers using a uh, solution NMR. We think this difference is a combination of the influence of the membrane uh, mimetic solvent, as well as the number of constraints that go into the structure. Now, having the structure is really important for knowing how to design better antiviral drugs to target this E channel. Uh, and hexamethylene amyloride is an inhibitor, is a known inhibitor, and our chemical shift measurements, uh, chemical shift perturbations uh, indicate that this drug binds to the N-terminal pore, causing a lot of shift, chemical shift changes. Uh, here's a docking model uh, suggesting uh, one possible binding mode with the uh, hexamethylene ring pointing up although uh, more detailed distance measurements uh, should be done to really pinpoint the binding uh, structure. So with that, um, I would like to uh, conclude, and I hope I have shown you the kind of uh, solid state NMR experiments that one can now uh, use uh, to uh, obtain detailed dynamics information about proteins. And here, the dynamics is really multifaceted. There's the proton transfer dynamics, side chain dynamics, overall protein conformational rearrangement, and finally also solvent dynamics that all go together to support uh, the proton uh, ion conduction. And uh, also, I hope I have shown you that uh, solid state NMR can allow us to determine the de novo high resolution uh, structures of uh, these uh, virus ion channels in the lipid bilayer uh, setting. So um, the recent work on E as well as BM2 were conducted by uh, Shiva Mandela in my group in collaboration with Marty Gelenta uh, for looking at the water dynamics um, in uh, BM2. And uh, Matt McKay uh, was a collaborator in solving the E structure and Alex and Aurelio all contributed to various aspects of the recent, uh, these uh, studies of the SARS-CoV-2. And earlier work on influenza M2, AM2 and BM2 were done by uh, these people. And uh, the M2 aspect um, of the uh, talk is a long time collaboration with Bill de Grotto's lab. And more recently with uh, Brad Pentiluta and Adam Willard um, at MIT, they all contributed to you know, chemical biological aspect as well as uh, computational aspects of these uh, studies. So with that, um, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to uh, answer questions. Thank you very much for this uh, beautiful talk. It's always mind boggling to see how much detail one can get from these uh, NMR experiments. And perhaps I will take uh, my prerogative as the chairperson and ask you the first question. So you mentioned in the talk, uh, at least two different uh, timescales that you extracted from the data, 400 per second, Mm -hmm. And you also said 400,000 per second. Yeah. Can you, can you say a few words about the difference in methodologies that are needed in order to obtain these different timescales? Yes. Um, the 400,000 times per second rate comes from a very detailed simulation of the line width of these exchange average M15 peaks. Those simulations took into account uh, NMR uh, experimental aspects such as proton decoupling, magic angle spinning, and so on. And it turns out though that number is not too different from a simple-minded analysis uh, if you just consider the isotropic chemical shift difference between the uh, unprotonated 250 ppm nitrogen and the protonated 170 ppm nitrogen. So, uh, so that's that's the source of a microsecond. Uh, 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 proton exchange rate. Now the 400 times per second, which is quite slow, that comes from looking at the uh, line shape of this exchange averaged um, uh, uh, peaks uh, at pH 5.5, 
Um, and uh, these isotropic shift difference between two resolved, the X and Y sets of uh, peaks, chemical shifts, are very small. They're only a few hundred hertz. And our averaging is not, you know, didn't give us a very narrow peaks, which means in NMR language, it's intermediate time scale motion that is causing just a slight, you know, merging of these two, two sets of peaks. And so from that, we get 400, 000, 400 times per second. We did not go any further than just stating that. And um, so, so that's, that's the origin of that number. And we're very happy to have seen that number because the, the proton, the overall proton flux, right, of this channel AM2 is about a thousand, right? That's one millisecond. And so uh, normally this, this is a kind of regime that gets a tricky to uh, measure directly uh, by NMR. But uh, this intermediate time scale line narrowing is how we pinpointed this rate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, let's move to a question by Anmesh. Unmesh, maybe you can uh, uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. Okay, uh, so I guess that's not possible. So I will uh, read the question. Professor Hong has mentioned in their paper that the glue eight is a possible uh, gating residue. What can be the possible protonation to open the ETM? Yeah, um, so we um, can see the uh, GLU-8 sidechain signal, COOH or COO, in the spectrum, but the, uh, this residue at the very end terminus is somewhat dynamic, and so it's a little bit hard to tease out. We're currently measuring the ETM uh, transmembrane uh, spectra more closely as a function of pH as well as calcium, so we uh, try to capture the open state of the channel, and we think that the channel is indeed open at low pH in, under calcium bound conditions. So the first study had uh, no calcium at all and was we focused on the pH 7.5 condition. And uh, by actually NMR, we can tell that the channel pore is um, better, much better hydrated at low pH and high calcium. And so, so uh, we hope that we can report this result uh, to the community soon. Yeah, and so the idea is that the uh, GLU-8 at low pH become uh, protonated and neutral, and then that would affect uh, the uh, helix bundle or helix orientation in some way uh, to allow uh, calcium passage. And it's also possible that this channel, nobody has measured the uh, proton current, but I, I think it's quite possible that it might also conduct uh, protons. So the ergic lumen is um, acidic, compared to the cytoplasm, which is neutral. So it's just that nobody has actually taken the trouble to, to measure the pro whether there is proton channel activity. Okay, next question by Hagen. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, May, for, for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a question to the, to the uh, M2 results. So if I understood the mechanism correctly, um, what you have is a protonation of a histidine from the internal side, and then there might be a ring flip or a tautomerization, then uh, yeah. you, you release the protons to the, to the other side. Yeah. Um, my question is, in general, it's very hard to reproduce the natural asymmetric environment that you have, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. So high proton concentration on one side, low proton concentration on the other side. And yeah. so in your experiment where you have isotropic environment, it could well be that both histidines are protonated simultaneously. And my question is, is there any way to figure out how ring flipping is, is, is affected by, um, by having two histidines protonated simultaneously from different sides? So is there, uh, do you think uh, this, this symmetric environment of equal proton concentrations from both sides could have an impact um, on ring flip uh, speed? Yeah, so this is a very good question. For a long time, we thought that the fact that nobody in in vitro studies can produce an asymmetric proton, you know, concentration gradient is a, an important flaw to structural biology. But it turns out not to be the case because the presence of a good gate, as shown here with the tryptophan, means that even though both sides are low pH, let's say I'm doing the pH 5.2, only Protons can only come from the N-terminal region. The C-terminal region is blocked. And so it is actually uh, asymmetric locally right. for the interior of the channel. 
Uh, and when we made the skating deficient mutant, then indeed both sides can be, you know, low pH. And then, then you have sort of the reverse protonation as well as forward protonation. That's why this histidine signal now is in the plus uh, three state. Um, now, when you do this uh, combination of the mutation and a drug blocking, then again, we then here, not again, we, we basically engineered a reverse proton uh, gradient, right? So, so, so here now the proton concentration is higher inside and it's basically low uh, on, the, on the outside and terminal side. Now, I think your question also uh, goes to this uh, double histidine motif, right? In BM2. Right. And this one is interesting. We actually have measured, I didn't show, the second histidine, the surface histidine's pKa. And that pKa, as you might imagine, because it's water exposed, it looks like a bulk histidine with a pKa, you know, all happening at around, you know, pH 6.5 or 7. So by the time you get to about 6.5, uh, for all practical purpose, you know, this is all just, you know, charged, right? And so then the, and meanwhile, the central histidine is just losing you know, it's it's proton very quickly to that to that position, right? So so that's that's what we know. So the, the two histidines uh, protonation uh, behavior are are kind of well separated uh, on a in a in a pKa sense. I so 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 this partially answers my question. So let me rephrase it: if you if you make the phenylalanine mutation, do you see a change in the ring flip uh, speed? Is there, is ah, there okay, okay. We did not actually measure the ring flip rate um, using the mutant uh, W41F mutant. And we also, for that matter, I would tell you, we did not make uh, a trip, a gating deficient mutant in the double histidine BM2. We have not done that. So yeah, you're yeah. asking what happens if instead of HXXS, WH, right? I, I have a HXXS F and then H. Right, that's, right. that's an interesting question. I, I suspect this will become a hopeless, uh, very poor channel. It, it just leaky throughout the C terminus. It wouldn't do it. You know, it wouldn't be very good. Yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay, we have a question from Ben, but Ben has a poor internet connection. So he asked me to read it. Uh, he says, um, these viral porins are really exciting systems. Could you say a few words about the membrane scission by the cytoplasmic domain? Um, yes. So what we have learned is that uh, uh, amphipathic helix, that's C-terminal to uh, the transmembrane domain, bends the membrane, causes tremendous curvature. And so that is necessary uh, to cause the uh, negative Gaussian, uh, you know, the curvature in order for uh, scission uh, and budding to occur. And so we can tell that curvature from phosphorus NMR spectra of amphipathic helix containing M2 construct. Uh, if you just have the transmembrane, you cannot see it. Uh, and it turns out that these two functions are somewhat uh, coupled. So if you have that amphipathic helix around and you uh, observe drug binding, I didn't talk anything about drug binding, then uh, this, cause, this curvature causes some complication to the drug binding. So the drug actually in, under certain conditions in some lipid bilayers wouldn't bind very well. Uh, so so that's, there's, that's one aspect. Another aspect is that, that uh, amphipathic helix uh, together with the transmembrane domain also sequester cholesterol to the uh, tetrameric protein. And that uh, cholesterol we think is important to um, attract multiple uh, tetramers together to the um, cholesterol rich uh, virus bottle zone in the cell plasma membrane. Okay, so we, we, we did this because we, we have actually measured uh, cholesterol contact uh, to uh, M2 in the presence of the amphipathic helix. We know that there is a uh, uh, cholesterol binding site in M2. So, so this membrane incision function of uh, M2 through this amphipathic helix is actually uh, coupled in interesting ways to the transmembrane domain, yeah. Okay, it looks like that was the last question. So I would like to thank you again, May, for this really exciting talk. And thank you all for staying till the end of the discussion and join us in two weeks for, actually we happen to have another magnetic resonance uh, lecture by Marius Klor. So I hope to see you all in that lecture as well. Thank you and bye-bye. Thanks a lot, May. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Thanks, John. I hope it's clear. <laughs> a lot of stuff. Okay. It was very clear.
Thank you. Thanks a lot.